Welcome to Psychology 205, Social Psychology. Let's start with a formal definition of what social psychology is. I'm going to define it as the scientific study of how our thoughts, feelings, and behavior are affected by other people. And the goals of social psychology is to understand and be able to predict social behavior. So what this course is really going to be about in one way or another is how we are affected by other people. The questions asked by social psychologists have been around since the beginning of time. Uh, you can go all the way back to the Old Testament of the Bible or look at some of the things that were written by ancient Greek philosophers and you'll see that um, people have always been interested in the same topics that social psychologists are interested in today. What makes people aggressive? What causes people to fall in love? What is the best way to change somebody's attitude? All of these are social psychological questions and even though they've been around forever, um, it's taken a long time for people to try to study these scientifically and I'll come back to that in a moment. But there are lots of other academic disciplines that are also interested in human social behavior. Anthropology and sociology probably most directly, but also political science, economics, uh, there are many different fields that look at human behavior. Uh, so sometimes I'll start my class off by asking students to tell me what they expect to be different in a social psychology class than they would find in some of these other classes and we have a discussion about that. But eventually we settle on some of the distinctive features. These are things that make social psychology a little bit different. First of all, it's empirical. So social psychologists depend on data. We like to collect information and observations, especially things that we can put numbers on and quantify. So a philosopher may be interested in some of the very same questions as a social psychologist, but uh, the social psychologist is going to depend on empirical data uh, in a way that the philosopher probably is not. Secondly, social psychology is not entirely experimental, but it's primarily experimental. We like to put people in situations where we manipulate variables to see what effect those variables will have. And this makes psychology different than fields like anthropology and sociology where uh, most of the data that is gathered is more observational uh, based on real world contexts rather than uh, manipulating things in the laboratory. In social psychology, the emphasis is usually on individuals rather than groups. We're certainly interested in how individuals are influenced by being part of a group, but for the most part, this term, we're not going to be dis uh, discussing large groups. We're not going to be discussing nations or tribes. The focus is really going to be on the behavior of individuals. <clears throat> also, Social psychology adheres to the principle of scientific determinism. Adhering to the principle of scientific determinism also makes social psychology different from some related fields of study. I sometimes like to simplify this by just calling it the billiard ball model of thinking about humans. If I'm at a pool table and I take the cue and I strike the cue ball um, and I hit it with a certain degree of force from a certain angle and it hits other balls and the balls scatter around the table. I think all of us accept the idea that where the balls end up on the table are, is determined by the laws of physics and that if we knew every relevant variable, if we knew exactly how level the table was, what the angle of impact was, what the speed of the cue ball was, we in principle ought to be able to predict where each and every ball will end up on the table because the balls are determined to do that. Now in practice, we don't know all of the things that we need to know, so most of us can't predict exactly where each and every ball is going to end up on the table. But that doesn't change our belief that the behavior of the balls is determined 
to happen in a lawful way. Well, social psychologists approach the study of human interaction the same way. If I were to introduce two individuals to each other, and if I knew all of the relevant details about them, uh, their emotional state, their history, their attitudes, all of those things, I ought to be able to predict how each individual fe will feel about the other one, what each in individual will think, what each individual will say. Now in reality, I don't know all of the relevant things, so I can't make that kind of prediction, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm assuming that these things happen for scientifically understandable, lawful reasons. This is not the way a lot of other academic disciplines think about human beings, and it's probably not the way that many of you think about human beings. I'm not trying to uh, persuade you or convert you to this way of thinking, but it is useful for you to understand that this is the approach that social psychologists are taking as they try to understand human behavior. Social psychologists also depend very heavily on something called operational definitions. So if I'm using language that appears in everyday life, let's say I'm doing a study on how people become romantically attracted to each other, I have to be able to specify what operations I'm using to define this thing I'm calling interpersonal attraction. Is the person just filling out a scale on a 1 to 10 scale? How much do you like the other person? In this case, uh, if that's what you're doing, you are operationally defining interpersonal attraction as the rating that an individual gives to another individual by using a 10 point scale. You have to specify exactly how you're defining the thing that you're talking about. So whether you're talking about attitudes or aggression or interpersonal attraction, uh, you need to rely very heavily on what operational definition uh, you're using. People outside of psychology sometimes have a problem with this because they'll say, well, that's not all interpersonal attraction is. Yes, we acknowledge that, but for our purposes of talking about it right now in this study, that is how we are operationally defining it. And another thing that most psychologists don't do that I will be doing is introducing uh, a strong evolutionary bias. I'm something of an evolutionary social psychologist, so I think that the way people behave now is a reflection of where what they had to be like uh, millions of years ago in our prehistoric environments. So essentially we're walking around with caveman brains uh, and the world that we live in now doesn't correspond as nicely to our uh, psychology as the world that we evolved in. So uh, that produces some interesting side effects, but we'll talk about that more later in the course. Let's return to the question of why social psychology has taken so long to develop. Given that humans have been asking social psychological questions for literally thousands of years, it's kind of curious that it's only been about a hundred years ago uh, that we have a field known as social psychology. And I think um, there's an interesting pattern in the way the sciences have developed. One of the first sciences that humans had any sort of handle on was astronomy. Uh, people in ancient times could predict the movement of the planets, the phases of the moon. They had models for how the universe was structured. And nothing could be further removed from day-to-day -day, uh, human social life than things that are happening literally light years away. And yet, that's one of the first things that humans studied scientifically. And after that, you began to see progress in things that we would now identify as physics. And it wasn't until about a thousand years ago or less uh, that you started to see the alchemists in Europe um, mess around with stuff that would eventually become chemistry. And biology really didn't take off as a field of study until about 300 years ago. So the closer and closer we get to life, and in particular human life, the more resistance there seems to have been to studying it scientifically. The first psychological studies took place in the late 1800s, roughly 1879 or so, and even these were sort of um, removed from 
the experience of emotion, personality, social interaction. They were more concerned with things like perception and memory. There is some dispute about when exactly the first social psychology experiments uh, occurred, but one of the most frequent uh, examples used is uh, some studies done by a person named Norman Triplett. Triplett was originally interested in um, human motor performance, how people use their muscles to perform physical tasks, and he was studying um, the things that influenced this. And he had people in laboratories riding exercise bicycles, uh, winding fishing reels, doing a variety of motor tasks. But one of the things he discovered was that when people were engaged in one of these motor tasks, if there was somebody else there doing the task with them, people did it with more intensity. They pedaled the exercise bike faster. They wound the fishing reel faster if other people were also doing the same thing. So our behavior was influenced by the presence of other people. And this is something that's come to be known as social facilitation. And you'll be learning about this in a later module in this course. But Triplett's experiments uh, were clearly social psychological studies and they have come down and through time, rightly or wrongly, as being given credit for being the first studies in social psychology. It wasn't until some time after that, uh, in the early 1900s, that we started to see books written that had the title Social Psychology in them. I think there are a number of different reasons why there was a resistance to thinking about human social behavior in a scientific way and therefore, it took social psychology a long time to develop. First of all, the way that humans think about ourselves gets in the way. Most people, especially in Western uh, societies, have sort of a what we call a dualistic view of how the human uh, is organized. Dualism means that you have a physical self. You have a body and a brain that's um, made of physical material stuff. But most people also believe that there is a non-physical, uh, spiritual essence to a person. It's got different names. It can be called the soul, the spirit, the essence. Sometimes the word mind is used that way. But we think of it as being like a ghost in the machine. You've got this physical self that's kind of like a robot, and inside there's this non-physical thing that's doing the thinking and the feeling. and uh, directing the behavior of the robot. So if you think about human psychology as being controlled by this non-physical thing, it would be very hard to apply the rules of physical science to that thing because it probably doesn't play by those rules. So the idea was that you can't study human social behavior scientifically because it's not subject to the same scientific laws as other things. So this dualistic way of thinking about humans got in the way. Also, there's something that I like to call Bubba psychology uh, that kind of impedes the way we think about uh, human social behavior. The word is derived from an old Yiddish word for grandmother, bubby. Um, and Baba psychology is psychology that everybody's old grandmother already knows. So what's the point in doing research to try to discover um, how it works? We already know how it works. And I think the reason uh, we fall into this trap is we do have all kinds of bits of common sense wisdom hanging around that can explain almost anything. So for example, if I was doing an experiment on why people become romantically attracted to each other, and I spent a lot of money and time uh, gathering data. And at the end of it all, I find out that people who are very different from each other tend to be drawn together almost magnetically. The person who likes to be the center of attention in the life of the party is gonna be most compatible with the person who doesn't wanna compete with them in that regard. And they're more likely to step back and let that person take the lead. Or a person who likes to be nurtured and taken care of would be, um, best paired up with somebody who's the opposite of that, somebody who likes to nurture and take care. They would make a good team. And so let's suppose I did these studies and found out that people that are very different from each other are the ones that tend to be drawn together. <laughs>
Well, the first reaction of many people to these results would be to go, well, duh, opposites attract. Everybody knows that. My old grandmother could have told you that. I can't believe you spent all of this time and money trying to figure that out. But let's suppose that the results came out exactly the opposite, that we've discovered that people who are very similar to each other are the ones that tend to be drawn together in romantic relationships. Well, the reaction that I get from people would probably be the same. Well, duh, birds of a feather flock together. Everybody knows that. My old grandmother knows that. I can't believe you wasted all that time and money to try to discover that. So you see the problem. No matter what you find, you think that you know it. And this illusion that we have, that we understand how things work already and that we don't need any research, certainly gets in the way of doing good research. Social psychology also has the problem of dealing with a very complicated set of variables. Trying to predict the relationships among people depends on so many things that it's almost impossible to control them well or even to know what all of them are. And compared with uh, producing a simple reaction in a chemistry lab, for example, where if you just know a few of the right things and account for those, uh, things take place the way they should, uh, it's just messier. It's harder to do good research. And I do think there are a collection of research difficulties that you find in social psychology that you don't find in most other fields. So let's discuss some of the research difficulties that you find in social psychology that may not be as much of a problem in some other areas of science. First of all, the problem of experimenter bias. The way the experimenter behaves in many studies can actually influence the outcome. If the experimenter is a little friendlier to some subjects than others, smiles a little more at females than they do at males, uh, whatever it might be, that can change the behavior of the people in the study. Uh, compare that with a chemist who's doing laboratory research where uh, smiling at or being friendlier toward one chemical versus another probably is not going to have that much of an influence on the results. And it can be especially tricky in situations where the experimenters are observing behavior, maybe that has been videotaped, and trying to decode or interpret uh, what's going on in the video. Uh, the expectations of the experimenter or the selective perceptions that that person uses may influence um, the, the outcome of the study. So experimenter bias is something that psychologists and social psychologists in particular need to be especially careful about. Social psychology has also traditionally had the problem of accessing a diverse population. Um, for quite some time, it's been ridiculed as being the science of American college sophomores because so many of the studies that have been done in social psychology have been done using people that social psychologists have easiest access to. And since most social psychologists doing research are professors, they're obviously going to use people in the universities where they work uh, that they have easy access to. And college students might be different from uh, all kinds of other people in all kinds of different ways. So the diversity of the subject pool uh, is a problem to be worried about. Also, most social psychologists are interested in the um, response of human beings to real-life social situations. And in the laboratory, trying to set up situations that have the kind of realism uh, that can capture that can be quite difficult. And so uh, to the extent that the laboratory fails to capture the kinds of things that go on in real life, this is another problem that uh, has to be overcome. There's the problem of demand characteristics. When a person's in a psychology experiment, the person isn't just kind of sitting there like a mindless clone. They are actively thinking about what's going on in the experiment. They're trying to figure out the hypothesis, and they're doing this so that they can change their behavior. Now, some uh, participants in experiments try to be what we call good subjects, uh, especially at Knox College. 
uh, you're participating in a study that maybe your professor is running or one of your suite mates or one of your teammates or somebody that you know, and you want that person to be successful. And so you're trying to figure out what's going on in the experiment so you can do the right thing and give the um, experimenter the expected results. Well, the experimenter doesn't want you to do this. They want you to behave genuinely and honestly. Uh, so they have to be on guard against people trying to help them out. There's also something called the screw you effect where people who don't want to really be in experiments and feel like they're being forced to do that uh, behave in a very contrary fashion. They're trying to figure out what the experiment's all about so they can mess it up. They want to do exactly the opposite of what they think the experimenter wants, and that can be very disruptive as well. I think most people don't do either one of those things. Most people simply want to come out of the experiment with a shred of dignity. They don't want to look foolish. They don't want to look stupid. They don't want to look silly in any way. And so they're going to be behaving in ways that they think are socially desirable. Now, the experimenter knows that people are worried about these things and they don't want them to be able to adjust their behavior. And so you have to be very careful about covering up the cues that might tip off the person as to what the experiments are about. <clears throat> These cues are known as demand characteristics. Now, sometimes demand characteristics are not a big problem. Let's say I'm doing an experiment on memory for faces, and I'm showing people pictures of faces and asking them to uh, later on tell me which ones they remember and which ones they don't. Well, most people, um, even if they know that's what the study is about, are not going to uh, alter their behavior very much. On the other hand, if you're doing something to find out how helpful somebody will be in an emergency situation, uh, you're going to find that uh, people will not necessarily behave the way they would in real life if they figure out that that's what the experiment's all about. So demand characteristics are cues that give away the purpose of the experiment. And experimenters sometimes have to worry a lot about minimizing the influence of demand characteristics in their study. And in social psychology, you simply have all kinds of ethical issues that you don't have in other fields. Uh, throughout the history of social psychology, there are famous examples of people um, thinking that they're about to receive possibly fatal electric shocks, or they unexpectedly see a rat's head cut off in front of them, or at the very least, they're uh, manipulated through deception or spied upon in places that they think are private, and subjecting people to physical and mental stress, invading their privacy, deceiving them, are definitely ethical concerns. And studies today go through a very rigorous uh, screening process through something called a, an institutional review board that uh, makes sure that the ethical needs of the experiment are being met. When you put all these things together, it can be tough to do good research in social psychology, and so perhaps it's not so surprising that it took so long for it to develop as a scientific discipline. <clears throat>